want to thank the elders as well for this opportunity. And uh, just want to let you know I have my surgery next Wednesday. My pacemaker number two is going to be on Wednesday. Uh, I think that the surgery is going to be at seven. But who knows, you know, sometimes they take longer to prepare a patient. You know how the nurses are. <laughs> so we were, uh, I was uh, playing uh, Handel's uh, The Messiah this morning. Guess why? Anybody guess? In my way here, from home here, I was playing the Messiah, Handel's. Remember what we say we were going to study? Psalms. Well, hopefully we will get there. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, Psalm number two uh, was the inspiration for Handel's music, the Messiah. That's why. I was thinking, what, what this man was thinking when he wrote this song? Well, he was thinking on Psalm chapter 2. We're not going to read this right now. We're going to go <clears throat> and see the... We're studying the gospel of Christ, remember? Um, I think this is where uh, we finished last weekend. But uh, we were talking about or the Lord as uh, the Lamb of God, and as the Lamb of God giving his precious blood for us. Wonderful gift. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity you give us to remember who your Son is in our lives, what he did for us, how you bless us every second in our of our lives, and we enjoy your blessings, Father. Thank you so much for the opportunity you give us to remember your son and thank you for his gift and for the Holy Spirit and for your word. Thank you for this communion when we enjoy with you and amongst us. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity you give us to study uh, your word. Help us with the purpose of being with you in the eternity in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So we were uh, mentioning about uh, the precious blood of Christ and uh, how he was uh, sacrificed as a perfect, perfect lamb, perfect sacrifice for our father. <clears throat> and um, Hebrews, that's the last um, scripture that we read last weekend, and we were talking about his flesh and his blood, uh, he had to go through through death um, because as God, he cannot die. Am I right? God cannot die. So he had to take a body in order to be offered in sacrifice because he couldn't die. As a matter of fact, the same Psalm 2 talks about the Messiah as the son of God. Am I right? So it had to be like that because he promised that he was going to rise up from death with his own power. And also the Bible says that the Father resuscitated him. So we are blessed with that. The Bible puts a lot of emphasis in the resurrection of the Lord. And uh, in verse 17, <clears throat> let's see what it says. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he may be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's us. And then uh, verse 27 or chapter 7, that's a reference of Leviticus 9, 7, reads, who does not need a daily 
as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. So two times he has been talking about this in the uh, verse 17, offering as a high priest. And uh, 727, about himself offering himself and giving you hints of what he's doing. So Christ was offered once to, be, to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appeal a second time apart from sin for salvation. And that's going to happen when? The last day, yeah? And this is the hint that I was giving you from the other two verses. The Lord was a high priest. Now, uh, what line of priest the Lord was descendant according to the law of Israel? According to, to Israel's law for the priest, priesthood, uh, the Levites, he didn't belong to that tribe. So he was not. He was not also a descendant of Aaron. He was not a, a high priest uh, descendant neither. So he was not going to be doing that. He had to, to find another one in order to, to offer himself as a sacrifice because he did it for himself. Am I right? He offered himself to God. And that's the Melchizedekian priesthood. Because what was the characteristic of Melchizedek? There is no beginning and end. And how is the Lord? Thank you very much, brother. That he has no beginning, no end. He's eternal. So that priesthood is the one that corresponds to Christ. And it's, uh, it was told, foretold in Psalms 110, verse 4. It reads like that. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You know, every time that I read more and more about the gospel and the roots of the gospel in the Old Testament, I am convinced that if all these priests, all these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes who surrounded the Lord in the first century, who, who saw him, if they could, would have been studying the Bible or his word or his law, do you think it would be impossible to recognize the Lord? I say to you, no. It would be easy to say, oh, he is. He is the Lord. He is the uh, Messiah. So this is one of those um, Hebrews uh, 7.12. For the priesthood be begin being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. What it means? There was no longer going to be the Levites or the high priest of Israel. So there was going to need, they, they needed and we needed a change of law too. That verse alone is enough for us to teach someone that the Old Testament is He's gone. He's gone. From all the, the book of Hebrews, that verse is like self-sufficient. Let's read uh, 7, 14 to 17. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which the tribe of Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood, and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who has come not according to the law of a fleshy commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And a little bit after that, he says that God um, swore on his name. So it's a very different event. Do you remember God swearing and confirming the law? Who, who confirmed the law with an amen? It was a people of Israel. But with this uh, Melchizedekian um, 
priesthood is the Father who is doing it. <clears throat> you are a priest forever. And that thing about being a priest forever, do you think it's different from the Israel too? How many years do you think they will officially serve as, as a priest? The, the people of Israel, the, this is for Christ. This is for the Lord. 40 years? Less? Well, the people of Israel uh, were serving sacrifices of uh, goats and bulls and all these uh, lambs every month, every weekend, etc. Until they, they died. But the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't die. That's the importance of having this type of, of uh, priesthood, according to Melchizedek, because there is no end in his blessings. So if he's on heaven advocating for us, when is that going to stop? Never. That's what he says in verse 17, that the Lord blesses us endlessly every day. That's why it's important to believe in, in Christ, to follow Christ, to obey the Lord until we die. Continuously being in communion with Him. Yes, brother. We need to understand that because the Levitical priesthood, Christ was not that lineage of Judah. Right? Okay. That should have told them that something was going to change. That the law was not going to be there because once he finished it, it was all going to change. Because you went from the political to Christ, it's like, whoops. Yep. Yep. But, but they, they want change. They want the change. No. It was their way of living. It was something very cherished for them. I'm going to hold it until I can. It was power. It was money. It was respect. It was the way of living for them. They were not willing to change. And they did everything they could to persevere in that. Until the Lord did the judgment. What happened with the city? The year 70. Was destroyed, huh? General Titus, the son of the emperor, took it and destroyed the city. Let's read uh, Hebrews 19, 8, 25. Thank you, Glenn, for the comment. For on one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. Do you, do you read that? Very important. So what, what makes things different, perfect now? Christ, the Lord. On the other hand, there is uh, uh, the bridling in a, I mean, the bringing in a better uh, hope through which we draw near to God, and as much as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, by him who say to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, <clears throat> excuse me, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to say to the other most, those who who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. How about the difference, huh? So he is in uh, the right hand of God right now, and he continues saving people all over the world because of that uh, priesthood. So up to now, yes, brother. Look at a goal. It went from almost a physical to a spiritual. Very very physical. Physical. Yeah. It's not a, you know, like you said earlier, where uh, the priesthood, you know, sacrificed physical animals, you know, money, a power and all that. Christ didn't want that. It was different. It was spiritual. It was yeah. to get you to... Uh, we're going to see more of that. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> Hebrews 10. 
verses 12 and 17, 18. For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for his sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. It's also a prophecy. Then he asked their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now there, where there is a remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So that's the guarantee we have that the Lord doesn't remember our sins no more because we don't need another sacrifice. Because otherwise, or Jesus will have to be sacrificed endlessly. So you don't have to die for your sins. Nothing you can do for your sins. Not even offering your own life or bleeding to death. No. The Lord already did that. That payment is enough. Once and for all. Don't, don't forget that. Don't, don't forget that. Because it was only once offered. It was good enough in the sight of God. Now Galatians, because it relates to us, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, that's the reason we are Christians now, we are children of God, because we were also baptized, baptized into Christ, we are put in Christ. Where is Christ? Where are you? Where are you? Physically, you can say, we are here. But spiritually, brother, sister, we are in the right of God. We are in heaven. Do you remember the Lord talking about our names being written in heaven? Is our presence there? Is you. What's important to God, it's there. You don't see it. We don't see it, but we will. We will see it when we pass away. That's why we are victorious when we die. That's why the, the Lord's death was victory over Satan. So, uh, verse 26, For you all are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you all as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and for you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He bought us. We belong to him. That's what it says in verse 20, 29. Now, we have seen the Lord as the lamp. We saw the Lord as the prophet. I mean, the priest, according to Melchizedek. Now we're going to see the Lord as prophet. We're going to do a, a couple of readings only. Deuteronomy 18 talks about it. Remember? Well, God was talking to Moses, and he's explaining about the characteristics of the prophet, but he starts talking about the one who was coming later, in the later days. And he's talking about the Lord, the, the Messiah, and he's talking about the people of Israel having to, to listen to that prophet in the same way the people of Israel had to listen to Moses. The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him choose, you shall hear according to you, do all you desire of the Lord your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And, and, and what the Lord say, yeah, <laughs> it's okay, let him stay over there away from, from the mount. <clears throat> Verse 18 and 19, I will rise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever 
will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require from it. What he says, uh, Acts about it. There are two, two uh, scriptures in Acts. Chapter 3, verses 22 to 26, and chapter 7, uh, 37. Peter and Stephen, inspired by the Holy Spirit, repeating the words of the Father. Yes, brother. After that prophecy, if I, my chronology is right, I think it was 1,500 years before Christ came, right? So there was 1,500 years from the time uh, God spoke that to Moses and Moses spoke it to the Jews. 1,500 years before the prophecy was fulfilled in Christ. However, that prophecy is still ongoing because he, Jesus speaks in my name and whoever will not hear it, God's going to require it of us even today. Even today. 2,000 years after the Christ. Yeah. Right? If, if people don't hear it, it's still going to be required of them. Sorry for you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's I don't know, pretty amazing. It is amazing. amazing. It is amazing. Because, because it's, it's the word of God there stating, oh, you better listen to, to the prophet. Peter and Stephen, inspired by the Holy Spirit, say it's Christ who fulfills that prophecy. Moses himself was a type of Christ in the sense that he was a legislator. He was uh, the freeder or uh, the person who liberated them from uh, Egypt. And for us, he freed us from sins. And then he also was a prophet for Israel. So both of them are talking about the fulfillment of that prophecy. Yes, brother. We look at this declaration in Deuteronomy. It says, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak all my commands. When we think about Jesus and go to John, the first chapter, what does he refer to as the word? And, and, and everything that, that God said was going to happen came through Jesus, through the word. And everything that would ever happen in the future, according to Deuteronomy, would come through the word. You are right. right. You are right. right. It is uh, uh, the Lord. Lord. The verb, the word of God. So we better listen to him. Because if not, what uh, Peter says, it will not be accounted as uh, the people of, of God, the nation of God. John chapter 5, 45 to 47. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe in my words? That's Christ talking to them. Huh? That was very serious because he knew the law perfectly. And the law was talking about Christ. Another um, way to recognize the Lord in the Old Testament. He's the king. Okay, they, some, some writers say that the genealogy of the Lord came from the priesthood and from the kingship of Israel. Two lines, two lineages. One from David, one from Mar Mariah. I don't know much about that, but I do know that um, the Lord is mentioned in the Bible as the king. Now, I put two different emblems there. One is a beautiful crown that may be made of whatever, precious stones, and the other one is not a beautiful crown. It's a painful, makes you bleed crown. What type of king was the Lord? The one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right, huh? But what happened with those guys who didn't want to let his, their privileges go? Do they want the, the crown on the right? No, they didn't want that one. They despised the Lord for his sacrifice for us. Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout out daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fall of a donkey. You remember that? It's in Matthew 21. The people wanted a king. The Lord had to fulfill that prophecy. And he came riding a donkey. And 
uh, the apostles helped him with the preparation, and he took it, and they were putting what on the floor? Alms, yeah, like the king that he is. And other, other uh, Old Testament uh, scriptures that talk about it, uh, Daniel 2, uh, 1 Samuel, Psalms 45, Psalms 110, they talk about the Lord being the king of, of Israel. And they fulfill. What other passage talks about the fulfillment of that prophecy? Hebrews chapter 1. The Lord talking about the son as a king. <clears throat> when he was talking to Pilate, he was mentioning these words. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate refer, re, therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You said it rightly. Yes. I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Similar concept of the prophet. But it's talking, it's talking here about his kingship. He is the king of Israel. Now, John chapter 1 says he came to do his thing, but his people didn't recognize him, didn't accept him. But we did. We did. And we are here. And it's not only us, millions of people around the world continue faithful to his voice and acknowledge him as our king. Mark 9, first verse, and he said to them, surely I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. When did that come to exist? When did verse 1 come to, came to a reality? The day in Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, sister. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it reads, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the what? The kingdom of God. It's what he was talking about. He was talking about the kingdom of God, and he was talking about the king of the kingdom. And the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. It's a consequence. Baptism is a consequence of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, of recognizing his power in our lives, accepting his word and us just following him, changing kingdoms, if you, if you may. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So do you think there is a relationship between, between Act 8 and Colossians 1? Of course. Huh? It's the kingdom, it's the redemption, it's the salvation, it's his power power on us, the blood of Christ, of course there is relationship. Hebrews 1.8, but to the Son he says, your throne of God is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Who's saying those words? The Father. Talking about the Son. It was the prophecy that we just read, and he confirms in Hebrews 1.8 that he's talking about Christ. So the Father is the one who is saying, hey, this is a king that lasts forever, not just like David or Solomon or whomever was there. Remember the class? Many kings in Israel, but one king forever blessing us all the time. 
Now, we're going to be reading many scriptures about, uh, not reading, but I'm just going to relate them, okay? I'm not going to go through them. Uh, you have them. Um, if you want a copy, I can give you a copy of this paperwork. Um, but just for us to relate the Old Testament scripture with the New Testament fulfillment, I put them over there. I didn't put them in the papers that I left up front, but I can do it. And I'm, I'm uh, going to also type um, one single piece of paper with the prophecies from Isaiah and the fulfillment of Isaiah prophecies in the New Testament next week. Lord willing, Lord willing. Or you can do like him. You can take pictures of the screen. <laughs> uh, why? Why do I um, preponderate? Why do I uh, accentuate Isaiah's prophecies? Did you know that the people of Israel nowadays do not study Isaiah in their classrooms? They have a one-to-one -one class with the masters of the law. It's too convincing. It's too much assertive that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So they have to give one-to-one -one class to the people, one-to-one -one explanations to the Israelites. Can you believe that? They do that nowadays. I was watching these, these videos in in the internet, he said, no, we don't have those classes about Isaiah in the schools. We do it one-to-one. -one. Here's why. So, in Isaiah 7, 14, uh, it says about uh, being born of a virgin. Where does it accomplish? Matthew 1. In Micah 5, 2, born in Bethlehem. Matthew 2, 6, Jeremiah 31, the children were killed, remember the prophecy? By Herod in Matthew 2. Isaiah 40, Micaiah 3 and 4, John the Baptist. I was talking to you about it last week, uh, how the prophets were talking about another prophet. Special man, special, because he was able to physically See the Lord and baptize the Lord and present the Lord as the Lamb of God for humanity. Special place for him. But even him being so special, we are more special. We are better in the sense that we didn't have to see the Lord in order to be, obey the Lord, number one. And number two, we are in the kingdom of Christ. And John was not. He was under the law of Israel. That makes a difference for us. Isaiah 35, what the Lord was doing when he was here. You don't believe my words, at least you, have, you can believe what I do. So the, those great signals of the Messiah, they were impossible to forget. They were very clear about his power, about his divinity. Oh, that, that's going to be very bad against them in the final day. Why well, you didn't believe that? Just like, like the, the words from the Lord, uh, was the baptism of John of men or from heaven? And they didn't answer. Isaiah 53, the people believe, not everybody. They were incredulous. Zechariah 9.9, Matthew 21, we just read about it. when He was triumphant in Jerusalem. And um, Isaiah 50, 53, verse 7, the silence of the Lord. When he was being accused and mistreated, he, he took it all. He had to for us. Do you know that the lambs, when you kill them, they don't fight you? They don't run away? They don't, they're not vocal against 
The one who's killing them? That was the Lord. The silence of the Lord. Isaiah 53, 12. Crucified between sinners. And he did pray for the sinners. Mark 15 and Luke 23. Both of them are in Isaiah 53. Verse 12. In verse 9, he was buried in a righteous man, Tom. Matthew 27, verse 57. Now, these are scriptures about the prophets. Now, remember what the Lord said was also completed, fulfilled on him? The prophecies from the prophets and the law and we're going to read. Zechariah 11, 12, the price of the Lord's 30 coins, silver coins. Zechariah 11, 13, the coins were used after they were thrown in, uh, inside the temple. Even that was registered there to purchase the land. In Zechariah 12.10, uh, someone will purse his, his side. The soldier did it in John 19. Psalms. So the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. They had to fulfill those prophecies. And the Lord did it. 22, oh, oh, before this. I didn't write it there, but um, some, the second Psalm, the second Psalm, he talks a lot about the Lord, very much. He talks a lot about his uh, situation being the victim of the govern government and the uh, Gentiles and Israelites working together, Herod, Pilate, working against him. Chapter 2, Psalms 2. I was telling you at the beginning uh, that psalm too, the second psalm is being used for uh, as a topic for song songs, Handel's uh, English songwriter, the Messiah, because of Psalm two. Pierre Robert and Jean Baptiste Lully also wrote uh, French uh, originals. They they wrote uh, songs about. Uh, these psalms, uh, Psalm 2. Mendelssohn also wrote inspiring Psalm 2. Why do you think that happened? What inspires people from the Lord? You can say many things, but he's talking about the uh, unfair treatment that we did give to him. And he took it. He suffered. One of these times you listen to the, it's a classical music at home. We don't play music here. But it's amazing how the word of God can inspire people, eh? artists. Okay, Psalm 22, 7. A detail about the enemies of the Lord. They were waging their heads. Oh my goodness, these guys. And it's registered in the Old Testament, in, in Psalm 22, 7. And was accomplished on uh, Matthew 27, 39. Uh, in verse 8, he trusted God. He must free him. Not in the times that we wanted, but he passed away before the others. As a matter of fact, none of his bones broke because he was already gone. He passed away. <clears throat> 22.16, that psalm talk about him being uh, nailed. And, and John, remember Thomas? Oh, I need to see that, that hand. I need to see his, I need to put my fingers there. Very drastic, very terrible expression. I'm going to hurt him more. 
in order to believe what you guys are saying. No, 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 no. Verse 18, they divided his garments among them. Terrible, those soldiers. But it was the use in those times. They used to do that. That was the payment for the day. 3220 did not break his bone, accomplished in John 19, 33. Psalm 16, 8 to 11, accomplished in Acts 2. He's resuscitated, his flesh did not see corruption, and Peter is talking about it. And guess what happened after that? 3,000 people believed the message, and they changed their lives. Psalm 45, 6 to 7, is accomplished in uh, Hebrews 1. We just read that. Your throne, O God, o God, is eternal. And who's talking there? The Father. God the Father. Yes, thank you. So, Psalms 110, 1. Christ ascended to the heavens. Christ as the King. Psalms uh, 110, 14. He was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. We just read about it, huh? Hebrews 7, 17. That's it for today. Let's pray. Will you lead us, please, come? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are very humble as we enter into your throne room today. We give you glory and honor for the great things you do upon this land. And we know that um, you have sent your only begotten Son to this world to come and save us from the death that is associated with the physical life. We pray, Father, that we are open-minded and, and we have learned from this class and other settings with your word that um, these things are spiritual and these things are eternal. Father, thank you for Victor's teaching today and through this whole class. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless Victor with his upcoming procedure being done on his heart and his upcoming studies to help his faith to continue to grow. Be with us as your children. Help us to learn. Help us to live. Help us to love. Thank you for sending Jesus to teach us all these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reba.